my mother died at the age of 56 of polycystic kidney disease. Okay. Uh, this was before uh, kidney dialysis was uh, becoming really effective. Kidney dialysis was just, in the early uh, 70s, it was just, it was very new. My mother died in 71. She was 56, yeah. So, uh, and <laughs> I have three sisters. They all have polycystic kidney disease. I have three children. Two of them have polycystic kidney disease. Every two or three days, uh, you have to set almost set aside half a day almost. Uh, well, you would have to get in the car and drive to the center. Um, it was 25 minutes away. Uh, you'd wait for a, a, a spot, a chair. You're hooked up maybe for a little, an hour or thereabouts. Um, the procedure would go on with any complications, any tweaks that had to be done. And then uh, after you finished, you have to um, uh, wait till the bleeding stops. And, and of course, there's um, uh, anticoagulants in the, in the um, uh, blood. So that, uh, and so stopping the bleeding is not always easy. Sometimes it stops in 10 or 15 minutes, but sometimes you're there an hour, an hour and a half. With hemodialysis, it was a big rigmarole in order to travel and to make arrangements ahead of time at the hospital. We had a, um, a, a meeting in uh, Ottawa, uh, Canada, and I had to make arrangements three months in advance. And interestingly enough, the day, the day we were leaving to go to, uh, to Ottawa, the, um, it took me an hour and a half to stop the bleeding. We got such a late start that when we got to London, Ontario, where we thought we were going to stay, all it was totally booked up. It was a major imposition on your life. You couldn't, I couldn't see having a job and doing that um, three times a week. Uh, we have friends who've been on hemodialysis, and often after uh, after they've had a session, they're exhausted for the rest of the day. Uh, I'm sure there are variations too, depending on why you've had kidney failure, because there are a variety of reasons that people have kidney failure. But uh, yes, it does take some, some energy away from you. But it also affects what you can eat. Um, you have to watch your diet, very, your fluid intake very carefully. and uh, You have to watch tomatoes and other kinds of things, and diet is very important. And you're aware always that something is wrong. It's a life, but it's not the kind of life that you can have under other conditions. The needles were jaunting as well. The needles were quite large. I was putting the needles in myself, mm -hmm. in my own arm, but uh, uh, you, you know, it's surprising what you can do when, you know, it all scares you beforehand, but it's surprising what you can do when, when uh, your life depends on it. We, we thought about uh, uh, doing it ourselves. And so we actually began training to um, have uh, do hemodialysis at our home. And uh, that's a, when you get into the details of that's very scary because there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Very quickly, your blood pressure can go down and you have to instantly jump up and make some changes. And as a teacher with no medical background, we're both bright enough to do it, but I found it was terrifying, the idea of he could die in front of me yeah. if I didn't move fast enough and think fast enough. I thought, no, this, <laughs> this is not. <laughs> the problem I had with hemodialysis, my veins are not really very big, and, they, and the fistula blocked off uh, three times, and after the second time it blocked off, uh, and that's a real chore. What they had to do when it, got, when it blocked off was they would take a steel rod and run it through your neck down next to your heart and we had to sign a, a waiver that said that if you um, uh, it, it was within an eighth of an inch of your heart and if, 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 if something happened that you wouldn't hold them responsible and I said uh, do I have to sign this and they said do you want to live so I signed it but it's really uh, very scary. 
you have to sleep setting up because if you if you uh, uh, turn the wrong way, uh, it could cause internal damages and uh, you'd be dead. Uh, I was on from June until um, August of 1992. And late August 92, uh, I went on, on peritoneal dialysis. Three months. I had been administrator of, of drug treatment programs. And um, uh, w when you have uh, a problem w with, uh, with your kidneys, you also have immune problems. So I was advised by my doctors n not to continue dealing with addicted folks because they have a lot of, uh, of diseases. So I really had to find something else to do. Um, I had done some writing over the years, and uh, Marion said, why don't you write a book? So um, I began writing the, uh, the book that was later sold at the Football Hall of Fame for, for more than a decade. But I could not have done that while I was on uh, hemodialysis. Um, it's just too restricting. Hemodialysis, it felt like you're married to someone who's ill. You have to carefully watch their diet. Um, you have to carefully make sure that they're at, um, they're at dialysis treatment on time, that they make their appointments. Um, it feels like you're married to someone ill. On peritoneal dialysis, it just feels like a minor inconvenience that can be dealt with very easily in your life, and your life feels more normal. We had a does time. what he has to do in order to um, follow doctor's directions and then just charges on with his life. He has not let this get in his way. But peritoneal all. dialysis really was very freeing. Mm -hmm. It also allows you to have a slightly better diet, frankly, than, uh, than you do with uh, hemodialysis. The cruise catheter was, uh, I think, an important innovation. It, Reduce the amount of time that it took to do a, to do an exchange, and uh, I think it made the exchange safer in, in many ways. Again, a lot of people who were on on uh, peritoneal dialysis were on the older, uh, less effective uh, uh, catheter, and uh, uh, that I think that was also an obstacle to it being to being accepted at least 20 years ago. Putting the catheter in your stomach was a relatively minor procedure. It's very straightforward and um, not very painful. No, not painful at all. I don't can't even you know minor minor distraction. The only real complication there was that it happened that the nurses on the um, kidney floor didn't know how to deal with peritoneal dialysis. So when it came time to uh, unhook me and do, they didn't know how to do it. And so I, I had to leave the hospital with this bag yeah. and found Dr. Cruz and he, he took, mm -hmm. took it apart. That was a kind of a strange thing. I, I mean, I, I suspect that maybe they're a little bit better at it now than they were then, but uh, the nurses on the floor and the kidney floor really weren't used to people with uh, perineal dialysis. When on peritoneal dialysis, life was more normal. The whole thing, less than 20 minutes, and um, spread out, it was spread out three times during the day, but you know, that includes your evening or whatever, and it's like, uh, it's like stopping for a cup of coffee almost. You could be working while the exchange was going on. It wasn't, a, it did, the one felt like a medical procedure, and there were nurses hovering. The other one felt like something more normal went to the bedroom or the bathroom or wherever and just did it. You could do it in the, <laughs> you could do it in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> which we did. We could easily travel on a whim, which we love to do, just take off and go. You put the packages in the back of the trunk and you go. And in the summer it would heat up and uh, uh, so that, you know, when you needed to do an exchange, you could just do the exchange. In the, uh, when it was colder, uh, Marion would go into a fast food place 
and ask them to uh, heat it up in the microwave, and they would, they would always uh, do it. 20 years ago, in the summer of 19, uh, 1993, uh, we decided to go to, to Yellowstone. So we just took off. We put all the boxes of the fluid in the, in the back seat and, uh, and, and just went out. And there's a, Marion took a picture of me uh, in the middle of Wyoming uh, on the way to Yellowstone. We were almost to Yellowstone. And, uh, yeah, Holding the bag up next <laughs> to the car. All you, you, could, you could see the horizon all the way around. We were in the middle of nowhere, and we parked the car, and he's doing his exchange, and I took a picture. I thought, this one, this is a picture. Uh, yeah, about a year and a half. I, I suppose if it had continued, if I hadn't gotten a kidney transplant, that we probably would have gone to a cycler. Uh, I was lucky enough to, in uh, a 19... Uh, 94. It was funny because we, we were, I, we made plans. I, I, I bought a tombstone and we, uh, uh, we made out a will and so forth. And, uh, uh, and then on, uh, on Monday and on, then on Thursday, I got a call saying that, uh, at, at 10 o'clock in the morning, said if I was at the hospital at uh, one o'clock, they had a kidney. Someone, uh, in California had died. I had a, they had a perfect match for me, and it, I was at the hospital. <laughs> By and large, it was uh, it was uh, there. There were relatively few difficulties in comparison to the kinds of things that my sisters and others have experienced with hemodialysis. He was happier, and I was happier um, when the doctors were recommending. Uh, hemodialysis. One nurse took me aside and said, you know, peritoneal dialysis is really easier to manage and a little easier on your body. And I thought about it, but everyone else was telling us something else. But that, uh, what she said sort of stayed in my mind and looking back, I would agree with her, having tried it both ways, that this is the way that um, doesn't impinge on your life so much. You can do exchanges in your office while you're working. Um, it doesn't require, you don't feel like such a patient, I think. You're, you're not going to a hospital or a clinic. He has an adventuring spirit, I think, and um, doesn't let things get in his way, doesn't overthink it, uh, does what he has to do, and then goes on and enjoys life, which I think if we could package his <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> His attitude, we can yeah. all retire rich. No, well, it's, I'm not the only one, you know. I think everyone who faces um, a dialysis is, uh, does it with courage. Most people do it with courage. I wrote a book while I was on peritoneal dialysis. Yeah. Was it perfect? Life is, uh, you know, life is really perfect, but it was good. I have two children uh, th that are getting almost to the age where they may have to go on dialysis. And uh, uh, I certainly have recommended to both of them that they consider peritoneal dialysis. I advised my sisters to try peritoneal dialysis. None of them did. I think that's a part, in part because um, the, doc, uh, the doctors that they were dealing with uh, were, were more familiar with, with, with uh, hemodialysis. Um, I, I would advise them to try peritoneal dialysis um, because I, you know, I just think that it's uh, gentler, easier, gives you more normal life. Um, and I just think there needs to be more education about, about that as an alternative. I also think that uh, when the doctors talk to you, that uh, there's a prejudice toward uh, hemodialysis. If doctors have a financial interest in it, they have no interest in changing. Uh, I think it's a combination of things. I think it's something they're, they're more familiar with. I think that uh, as an industry has grown up around it, and that's probably a factor. Um, I think that when patients ask somebody that 
most likely people they ask are people that are on hemodialysis. So I think that's probably the, the difficulty. I'm yeah. surprised, I guess, that after all these years and after our great experience, that you're still um, encountering opposition, medical opposition. People are afraid of change itself. We've always done it this way. It's worked for us. I'm sort of amazed that we're still discussing this as um, an option. It seems like a no-brainer that people would be at least starting out with peritoneal dialysis um, to normalize their life for a longer period of time. But healthcare costs nationally are out of control, and this is a way to control it because dialysis is very common now. People, in Oak Park on the corner, we have a dialysis unit. And um, all those people could be functioning much easier at home, and they just don't know what's available. But uh, it's also uh, very, ex it's, it's the part of the, uh, of, of the insurance problem for the, for the federal government that's growing most rapidly and really needs to be brought more under control. And uh, what you're talking about doing here would be an enormous uh, savings uh, for the federal government. Health care is so costly in the United States right now. It's a huge problem. Huge problem for mayors because our costs, healthcare costs are going up and up. If this is a cheaper alternative, I think we need to take a very hard look at it. Here's the other thing. I mean, I'm really grateful for, uh, for Medicare because you know, kidney uh, treatment is covered by it and I wouldn't be alive without Medicare. Maybe instead of uh, talking to doctors, we need to be talking to patients. Well, it's like when a new car model comes out, it's an, all the bugs aren't quite out of it and improvements have been made, and I understand further improvements have been made. So I think the medical profession needs to give it another look because from the patient's point of view, there's no comparison. Um, you have a normal life. You're not watching everything you put in your mouth. You don't feel ill or odd. Um, it's something that you can live with and work with. So I feel very fortunate. Yeah, I feel blessed, really. And I think it's, you know, it's made a, Marion can talk about whether it's how affected lives, but I think that the peritoneal dialysis was a blessing um, that got us to the kidney transplant, um, and uh, we're grateful to be alive when we're alive when this technology is available. I don't think I would be alive if it hadn't been for peritoneal dialysis and Dr. Cruz.